In this following video, let's understand the strategies and the principles of managing a patient who presents to you with a preoperative zonda dialysis. A thorough clinical examination with a fully dilated pupil to try and evaluate the extent of the zonda dialysis is imperative. Needless to say, the rest of the eye should be examined in detail to rule out any other pathologies either in the posterior segment or anywhere else. Look for the extent of phacodonuses. Look under retroillumination for whether the zonules appear to be weak or they are absent. If there is a patient who's had a traumatic zonular dialysis, also look for the status of the pupil. There could be an associated traumatic midriasis that actually needs to be addressed as well. Evaluation of the intraocular pressure as well as evaluation of the posterior segment is important to rule out any other pathology in the posterior segment. Special investigations like ultrasound via microscopy is essential to be able to be even more clear as to what exactly is the extent of the dialysis. The patient needs to be counseled in detail. We need to explain to him in his vernacular language what exactly is going on within his eye the status of his cataract, the instability of the lens because of the lack of the zonal support, the unpredictability of the outcome, the possibility of requiring a vitreoretinal retinal intervention, the possibility even of a second surgery, or perhaps even leaving the patient aphagic, and finally the guarded visual prognosis in this case have to be explained to the patient. The capsule tension ring can be used to give adequate stability in a patient with a localized zonular weakness of about three to four clock hours. If one were faced with a zonular dialysis larger than three or four clock hours, perhaps you would require a scleral fixated capsule tension ring or a segment in order to provide adequate stability. I'd like to now discuss with you a few aspects of this capsule tension ring. A capsule tension ring is an incomplete circular ring made out of PMMA. Both the ends have an eyelet, which increase the safety and the ease with which the capsule tension ring is introduced into the capsular bag. The capsule tension ring, when introduced within the capsular bag, does an excellent job of centering, expanding and stabilizing the capsular bag. And by doing so, they facilitate safe and successful phacoemulsification surgery. And here's how it works. When positioned in the capsular bag, this ring exerts an outward force that redistributes the tension from the area of the intact zonules to strengthen the areas of the weak or the missing zonules. We next come to the sizing of the ring. Now, typically the ring that we use in our center is a 10 by 12 capsule tension ring, which means it has a diameter of 12 millimeters, which can be compressed up to 10 millimeters. Ideally, you want a capsule tension ring which is slightly larger than the capsular bag. We also have rings which are 13 millimeters that can be compressed 11 millimeters, which we could use in slightly larger eyes. Next, we come to the timing of the insertion of the capsule tension ring. Now, this capsule tension ring can be introduced into the capsular bag at any point after the creation of the capsular excess. It is controversial, some people like to introduce it after the end of nuclear emulsification, but personally, I like to introduce it as early as possible and therefore do so immediately after making the rexes, as I'd like to provide the stability to the capsule bag as early as possible. The downside of this is that sometimes the removal of the cortex may be slightly challenging, and we will discuss in this case how that can be done with significant ease as well. Now here's what you need to be cautious about. When a capsule tension ring is introduced into the capsular bag, it does induce its own centrifugal forces onto the equator of the bag. Care and caution and a correct technique needs to be used whilst inserting the capsular tension ring into the capsular bag. Should you find any resistance during the passage of the CTR into the bag at any point during its insertion, it may mean that it's actually going through the bag. And therefore, it is very important at this point to just withdraw the capsule tension ring and then have another alternate plan. When the capsule tension ring has expanded the capsular bag, the posterior capsule is at a slightly anterior position as compared to what you're normally used to. Be mindful of this fact 
so that you make sure that when you're managing these patients, you do not inadvertently create a posterior capsular rupture. Third, remember that you cannot introduce a CTR in the capsular bag if you have a tear in the anterior capsule because if you were to attempt to do so, the tear in the anterior capsule due to the centrifugal forces now applied is likely to go on into the posterior capsule resulting in a posterior capsular rupture and the possibility of subsequent dislodgement of the capsule tension ring into the vitreous. Let's now move to watching the surgery. Now this patient presented to our outpatient department with a history of blunt trauma a few years ago. He presented to us with four clock hours of the zonular dialysis inferiorly and a grade two nucleosclerotic cataract. I'd like to now share with you the principles of managing this patient with a four clock hour of the zonular dialysis. Needless to say, we need to be extremely meticulous while creating both the main incision as well as the paracentesis incisions. The reason for this is that you don't want to have any difficulty in negotiating and manipulating the instruments in and out of the eye, neither do you want an incision that is too large that can result in unwanted shallowing of the anterior chamber intraoperatively. Next, in view of the existing zonular dialysis, we need to be cautious as to how much blue dye we inject into the eye. As you've seen just now, just a few drops onto the anterior capsule is adequate. The washing out of the excessive blue dye also needs to be extremely gently performed. Next, we proceed with insufflating the anterior chamber with viscoelastic prior to performing the rexes. All air bubbles need to be removed from the anterior chamber as they are going to hamper visibility during the capsular rexes. The capsular rexes is one of the most challenging steps in a patient with a zonular dialysis. This is because of the asymmetric pull on the anterior capsule, which is as a result of the absent or the weakened zonules. The reason for this is that there is an asymmetric pull onto the anterior capsule as a result of the zonular dialysis. Moreover, the centration of the rexes may also be a challenge in a patient with a zonular dialysis. Very often, or rather more often than not, one needs to use forceps to be able to pick up the torn capsule and negotiate and complete the capsular rexes. As you can see here, we have a fairly well-centered capsular rexes, centered onto the center of the nucleus itself. The capsular rexes should be at least 5.5 millimeters in size to allow for the ease of insertion of the capsule tension ring. Now here's another important step. In order to facilitate the ease of insertion of the capsule tension ring within the capsular bag, I introduce a cohesive viscoelastic which actually creates a gap between the anterior capsule and the underlying nucleus. We now move to the inserting of the CTR. This is the CTR that we are using which is a 12 by 10 millimeter one, which is a 12 millimeter one which is compressible to 10 millimeters. I'd like to now share with you the technique that I think is the simplest technique of inserting a CTR into the capsular bag. Now, to begin with, I always introduce a capsule tension ring through the main 2.8 tunnel. The reason for that is that when I need to finally put in the trailing eyelet, it's extremely easy for me to hold it with the end of the McPherson's and flex it into the eye, as you will see a little later. Once the leading eyelet enters into the capsular bag, the rest of the CTR is introduced into the capsular bag with a hand-on-hand -hand maneuver. In order to confirm that the CTR is truly within the bag, I tend to just tint the anterior capsule a little at the point of its contact with the CTR. Now here's a simple trick to allow for ease of insertion of the trailing eyelet. The trailing eyelet is held with the McPherson's introduced within the tunnel into the anterior chamber, dipped down and released 
thereby releasing the trailing eyelet into the capsular bag. The successful insertion of the CTR within the capsular bag is denoted by the opening out of the capsular bag and the inability to now make out the area of the subluxation. The next step is a gentle hydrodissection. We then proceed with the nucleus emulsification. Since the inferior nucleus pole seems to have prolapsed into the anterior chamber, I choose to perform a supracapsular phaco emulsification. What I do is I downsize the nucleus in its elevated position into smaller fragments prior to the emulsification. Because I'm working in the supracapsular plane, I take my time to intermittently perform a viscofluid exchange with a view of protecting the corneal endothelium. Performing a supracapsular phaco prolapsed out during hydrodissection. The other advantage of performing a supracapsular phaco here is that none of the forces of phaco emulsification are transmitted to an already compromised capsular bag. And considering the pre-existing zonular dialysis, you want to work with low flow settings, that is a power just adequate to allow for emulsification of the nucleus, a vacuum that facilitates the nucleus disassembly procedure of your choice, and finally a low flow rate so that things happen in the eye in a slow controlled manner. Next we proceed with a bimanual irrigation aspiration. Removal of the cortex may sometimes be challenging in a patient with a zonular dialysis who's had a CTR implanted in the capsular bag. This is because the cortex sometimes gets trapped between the CTR and the equator of the bag. You'll see what happens when we try to remove the inferior cortex. On attempting to remove the trapped cortex, as you can see inferiorly, it pulls on the CTR and tends to pull the CTR inward. The way out of this is by holding on to the cortex, drawing it towards the open loop of the CTR and then aspirating it. You will now see the rest of the cortical aspiration. At the end of the irrigation aspiration, once more I perform a viscofluid exchange prior to the removal of the irrigation cannula from the eye. After introducing some more viscoelastic to expand the capsular bag, we now proceed to enlarging the section to a 3.2 mm incision prior to the loading and the insertion of a 3-piece IOL within the capsular bag. My choice of a 3-piece IOL here is really to further enhance the stability of the capsular bag. You will now see the insertion of the 3-piece IOL in this part of the video. Having loaded the lens, it is brought out up to the tip and its orientation is carefully examined under the microscope because it guides us into how we need to twist the injector around to allow for the smooth entry of the trailing haptic into the capsular bag. As you can see, the injector is now rotated to get to the correct orientation in a manner that the lower haptic gets injected into the capsular bag and the optic into the anterior chamber. The trailing haptic for now still remains outside the eye. With the help of a Google and hook hitched at the trailing optic haptic junction, an attempt is made to rotate the trailing haptic within the capsular bag. However, it ends up slipping into the ciliary sulcus. The lens is then rotated and re-rotated in such a manner as to ensure it ends up in the capsular bag. As you will now be able to make out, we've got a complete rexus cover over the IOL optic. Following the IOL implantation, the excessive viscoelastic is then gently removed from the anterior chamber. 
We need to ensure that we avoid any excessive rocking movements on the IOL, nor tilt it up and down to go behind it to wash behind it, because you don't wish to compromise the stability of the capsular bag even at this step. And finally, we get to the last step of this case, the stromal hydration. Both the paracentesis incisions, as well as the now enlarged 3.2 mm incision, are hydrated. This brings us to the end of the case. We had an optimal end result of a well-centered IOL within a stabilized capsular bag. With this, I come to the end of my presentation of the use of a CTR in the management of a mild to moderate subluxation. I hope you found it useful. Thank you.